Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today, I'm very happy to have you back on the show, the one, the only, James Montemagno. How's it going, Robert? Awesome. Yeah, I know. They gave me my own show here. I know, so and now you, you don't come on my show anymore because <laughs> yeah. you have your own show. I remember. I went back and watched the videos from like uh, four years ago or yeah. so when I first came on. I think I was wearing something very similar, a mm -hmm. cardigan and a C-sharp yep, shirt. So. this. This did not exist, no, yes. but I wanted to come back on in kind of my traditional classic cool. Cardi action uh, for a little reunion between us. Excellent. I'm really excited. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so am I. Yeah. We are going to talk about the mobile side of the Smart Hotel 360 reference app. Yes. Uh, so just to bring everybody up to speed, Smart Hotel 360 was the app that we first showed at Connect all the way back in November. Yeah. Um, and it is a, a hotel, there's a website, there's a mobile site, there's microservices running in containers, as this beautiful, beautiful diagram. diagram shows. Uh, in the previous episode, we did the website and the Azure functions. Um, we're going to do all these services in the middle, booking, searching, mm -hmm. etc. Those are all running in containers. We'll talk about that later. But the website talks to those and the mobile app talks to those. Correct. And we're going to focus on this mobile app stuff today. You're going to show us cool stuff. Yeah, so if I was to zoom in on here, so uh, if I was to really zoom on the architecture diagram, like I went on stage and when I talked about the Smart Hotel 360 apps, we really consider it a suite of products. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not just one application. It's a consumer app that we see here running on iOS, Android, and Windows 10. Yep. We have uh, a smart doorbell, essentially, which is this NFC Xamarin Android application. Mm -hmm. And the idea here, and we have it on stage here um, for VS Toolbox, is that it would be like an embedded hardware where you're running a custom application. So we can kind of see here, uh, we can zoom in on the little tablet here. This would be embedded into a door right. to unlock the actual door yeah. with your phone. Which sounds very science fiction-y, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really not. The technology exists. It's right? there. You could We've do it with your watch. We've got smart thermostats. We've got smart toilets. Mm -hmm. How long until we have smart doorknobs in hotels? Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 And then finally, the big part here is we have another maintenance application that was written traditionally with Xamarin and iOS. So no cross-platform UI, okay. but we actually extended it um, to Android using some of the new Xamarin Forms capabilities. So, all of these, like you said, talk to Azure AD, uh, AD B2C for authentication. Okay. They talk to all of these uh, Azure container services. And we'll see that in the APIs. And it'll feel real, um, real um, good for .NET developers because it's just making RESTful service calls right. back and forth. So that in a high level is the architecture. And as we can see, it talks to Twitter, it talks to the databases, everything like that. And this is really good architecture because when you're building a large application, you have mm -hmm. a lot of moving parts. So right. you never want your mobile apps to talk directly to a database, right? That's sure. a bad idea. Sure. What happens if something gets dropped in the connection? You go through a tunnel. You want something really resilient. Mm -hmm. So that is why the mobile apps talk to these APIs for all the different services. Some are running Node, some are running .NET Core, and that's right. nice. It's just a yep. web API. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you want me to kind of run through it a yeah. little bit? Yeah. yeah. Let's see it. Yeah. So if you didn't get to see it uh, at uh, Connect, I have my actual Android device in front of me here, which is what you're seeing on the right-hand side being uh, reflected. Yeah, we did this run through in the in the very first episode. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric and I did the kind of overview, overview, but it, it's certainly helpful to see it again. Yeah, and then on the left hand side, you have our remote iOS simulator. So I debugged it and I sent it over here. That's uh, that's only an enterprise feature, right? Is, is that true? No, it's now available for everything. Oh. It's something that we we changed at Connect <laughs> actually is we call that in the business we call that a softball <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, you just. Uh, it's available for everyone. So I do have VS Enterprise, but um, but it works in Community Edition mm -hmm. now. Cool. And what the remote iOS simulator does is I have a connection to my Mac, which is uh, which is on the, the floor, floor. So over here. You still here. need a Mac. Still need a Mac somewhere, uh, and then you connect, but the simulator uh, pops up right in front uh, on your Windows machine. Cool. So here I've already logged in on the so device. That's a good looking yeah. app, and yeah. it's a Xamarin Forms app. Mm -hmm. It looks very good looking. I know, like early on. You know, it was kind of like, well, Xamarin Forms, you know, it's it's good for good enough internal apps, mm -hmm. but if you want the best looking apps and the most full features of the platform, you, sh you would probably go Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android. Yeah. But that looks like a pretty good app. So, yeah, we have like these a, days, yeah. what would the advice be on when to use Forms, when not to use Forms? Yeah, so we built this. Um, 
with Xamarin Forms cross-platform user interface. So if you're newer to Xamarin, we have two approaches, what Robert just described. Mm -hmm. We have our Xamarin native like, classic approach, which is building the UI for each platform, but sharing all of your backend code, right. so models, view models, RESTful services. And then Xamarin Forms, we abstracted tons of common UI controls. Now what's great is that we have an amazing community of developers. What we'll show in the code is how we've able to leverage a lot of plugins to extend control. So like actually this little view that I'm swiping through, a carousel mm -hmm. view is built by the community. Mm. We have custom charts and graphs, which I'll show off as well. Uh, so let's say I book a hotel room here. We'll do that really quick on the different devices. So you can get a feel for it here. And then we'll talk about when you would use what. So let's book something in Seattle, for instance. I'm going to try to do these both at the same time. It's a little bit tricky to do. Let's go ahead and do that here. We have this beautiful um, uh, chart and graph, or, or the calendar control, I should say, with some nice animations. But they're a little bit different on each platform. Sure. We just kind of customize the buttons back and forth. We can pick the hotel um, on here. We get these really nice uh, parallax on each platform, which is cool. And then we can go ahead and book. It looks beautiful, right? Yeah, um, it does. But notice that you still get native dialogue pop-ups. Right. We have these beautiful charts and graphs. Um, on here. And I will say it's like a great time to be not only just a Xamarin developer, .NET developer, but even a XAML developer because there's this immense amount of open source mm -hmm. projects that extend these controls. So that, um, that carousel view on top, these um, custom charts are yeah. called micro charts, that, which are powered by um, something that we call Skia Sharp. Skia Sharp is a cross platform 2D and 3D graphics library that runs natively on each platform. Mm -hmm. So you can do essentially system.drawing everywhere, right? So, right? so we're able to take advantage of all those and really build these beautiful applications. Yeah. So if you're kind of yeah. laboring or, or you're under the older old impression now that you can't use Xamarin Forms to build really good looking apps, that's that's clearly no longer true. Th that's what we came out to really prove here yeah. is that um, things have evolved a lot over time. Not only has Xamarin Forms gone through a lot of releases mm -hmm. for performance, adding features, keeping up with the platforms. You know, we have special features built in uh, for of iPhone X. I just you know? have to say that in the latest builds, the person that uh, the the team that was responsible for UWP project creation mm -hmm. going from this long to this long. <laughs> yeah, we've done Thank a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've been My able, new heroes. Yeah, you can go into Visual Studio, say file new project, and you have it all scaffolded out it's in a few. so fast yeah. now. Yeah, because we've done, we've yeah. upgraded to .NET standard. We use package references, so your NuGets get downloaded extremely fast, mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. Now, this app, though, too, is not just on iOS and Android. I kind of gave this example that, hey, when you get into the hotel room, you kind of change context. So the right. Smart Hotel 360 has the same experience, but the idea that the hotel has tablets inside the room, so like right. a Surface book or Surface um, tablet. Mm -hmm. So here I have the actual application uh, over here, but I have it on my Windows 10. Imagine this was a Surface. Yep. So I could come in, I could take a look at my room. Uh, if I needed to change the settings, I have all these custom sliders that are in here. I mean, it's a really beautiful looking application. Um, I can uh, take a look at restaurants nearby. It can get my um, location um, of the device that's so going to go and synchronize my location. Here we've kind of hard coded it so it gets ah, okay. it from New York, which is this is what you saw up top. Right. But it gets the location, comes in, you can see all the coffee shops. So it's a really beautiful optimized. This is the same app mm -hmm. that's on mobile. Right. But notice that it has a, a really great Windows 10 experience on the tablet. So we did that, but I think what's important too, when you ask the question between Xamarin Native and Xamarin Forms, is that you can still access the native capabilities no matter what. And I think right. that's one thing we want to say. We just got geolocation. We made it so the smart hotel door, when you come in, you can come in and tap and unlock. So if we zoom in on the tablet, there's my face. And since I'm logged in with auth and the door is synchronized with NFC to look for special codes. Okay, so you logged in and, on the phone yep. and that's using the, the Azure Active Directory, Directory B2C. Yep, business to consumer. Yep. Yep. And then I have this NFC button. So right. if my device has NFC, I can tap it to the door mm -hmm. and boom, it unlocks it because it knows it's me. Cool. So that's how we kind of think of it. So to get back to your question, when would you use one versus the other? Well, it kind of depends. I mean, for me, I'm a huge XAML developer. It's where yeah. I feel really comfortable. Right. We've made it really easy to blend the worlds together. And so no matter which way you start, you're not locked into that approach. Um, we have 
uh, two different things. One thing that we call native forms um, and another one that we call platform specifics. So let me kind of tell you what that means. Let's say you start with a Xamarin Forms application. You're mm -hmm. like, I'm all Xamarin Forms, XAML everywhere. But you're like, oh man, I really want to use that iOS only kind of control. Well, what you can do today is you can either create a custom renderer, like a custom control, if you will, mm -hmm. access on iOS, and then blend it in. Or we've added it so you can add a custom namespace for iOS into your XAML or Android or UWP. If you're not running on those one of those platforms, it just ignores it. So okay. I could do iOS, give me a segmented control, and it just shows up. Because Xamarin Forms user interfaces are native controls. So we made right. it a way yeah, where you can shove you, it in right. it. Because whether you're using Forms or mm -hmm. Xamarin iOS or Xamarin Android, you're still wrapping the underlying API. Yeah, it's 100% exactly. coverage of the API, yeah. which you know, has been the feature since day one. So exactly. It, it seems like it wouldn't have been well, everything is hard, but <laughs> conceptually, it wouldn't have been that hard from sure. Xamarin Forms to call into the API in a different direction because you already wrote that code. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing that we did is a lot of developers started with just a Xamarin native application. Right. So they're doing, or they already have a UWP app and like, hey, how do I go now to iOS or Android? Yep. Um, and, um, or they've created an iOS app with storyboards and like, Man, I, I love my application. It's perfect. I have super performance, one to one. I have all the APIs, but I notice that some of these screens, like the About screen, the Settings screen, those screens are kind of generic. I right. would love to reuse those if I go to Android. A lot of developers start with just one platform, mm -hmm. or maybe two, and then they want to go to more. So Xamarin Forms native forms. What that does is it allows you to take any Xamarin Forms page and convert it into an iOS, Android, or UWP control okay. that you just put into the Xamarin um, app. So for instance, let's say I have an item and I say item, I tap on it, well this detail page, I'd say new Xamarin Forms page, and then I'd say to fragment, and it would create a an Android fragment that I could then use. Cool. So that means I can start using reusable um, user interface mm -hmm. without blowing away my entire application. Because right. if you spent all this work, years, building an application, why throw it all yeah. away? Just, hey, let me just start blending in some and XAML. You then conceivably have a team of two people or four people, yeah. half of them who are Xamarin Forms, half of them who are Xamarin Native, and they yeah. all get to play together. Yeah, and then all right. of that back-end code, right? All of your models, view models, Azure integrations, things like that. That's all just .NET code. Sure. You know, in general. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I geek out on it because so much has happened in the in the space of mm -hmm. not only does Xamarin, our integrations into Visual Studio, but our wonderful community of developers that are building right. plugins, custom controls. I mean, that's why this stuff like yeah. this is possible. So yes, cool. the, the the answer is it's a great to with both platforms, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, is definitely the route to go. Yeah. I think it's always great to learn the native platforms though, like definitely learn those because then you'll know why Android works a little bit this right. way. I, I think I've always said that iOS works a little this way because yeah. when you need to go tap into those functionalities, mm -hmm. you can. Yep. Yep. Cool. Let's see some code. All right, cool. Now now we've talked through it a whole bunch, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I can walk through the diagram here. I have both of the apps that I just showed uh, over inside of Visual Studio. So what I want to show you is kind of the architecture here. Mm -hmm. uh, and this will look very familiar to the architecture that I've been um, you know, coming on the show talking about for a, a lot of years. We have our shared code, which in this instance is a .NET standard uh, 2.0 library. So we can see our, our .NET standard library mm -hmm. here. We have all of our NuGet packages that were being pulled in. And a lot of these here, we'll go ahead and move this over here. Uh, a lot of these are coming from Xamarin Forms and our map controls, because we saw some maps on there. Yep. But we're also using some cross-platform libraries. So the first thing we'll see is we're using App Center, Visual okay. Studio App Center. That was built um, uh, full CI, CD uh, on our application, but includes analytics and crash reporting, distribution, and push notifications. Uh, for our authentication, we're using our Microsoft Identity client. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have then uh, some cross-platform plugins, such as our geolocator plugin, settings, and then some Xamarin form specific things. So we have a cool animation library called Xam Animation, uh, and then those micro chart controls, so all those charts and graphs in there too. But then you're going to see some other things that maybe a lot of .NET developers are familiar with, like AutoFact, Autofact which yeah. is an IOC container. 
So we have, everything is interface based first, mm -hmm. so we can do proper uh, uh, testing on the application. So the developers here chose to use Autofac because okay. they're familiar with it. You could use other things too, like Ninjact or um, Roll Your Own or right. Xamarin Forms has its own dependency yeah. service as well. Yeah. And then, of course, that's where all of the bulk of the business logic lives. So really, this is just .NET stuff yes. with some user interface. So we have some uh, models. So here's like a hotel, for instance, just mm -hmm. stuff coming from the server. We have our you know, uh, code lens coming in there. We have um, our services. So we have some things like analytic, booking, charts, hotels, locations. Just look at the booking service code mm -hmm. just very quickly. Yeah. So that is the code that at some point goes off and calls the service living somewhere. So it's no doubt under that URI builder. There's a booking yep. endpoint, yep. right? Okay. And that is what talks to the booking service, which is sitting, uh, yeah. winds up in that Kubernetes cluster. But so I, as the developer, don't need yeah. to care mm -mm. what that's written in. The fact that it's in a Kubernetes cluster, what the heck is that? I don't exactly. know. Exactly. Here's an API, here's a, a URL to go talk to, the RESTful endpoint, yep. right? And then I just call it. Yep. And I understand what to send it, I understand what I get back. Yeah, so and how we configure yep. this too is all of these are in our app settings. Okay. So every single endpoint is customizable. So ah, cool. we actually okay. load all of these for development purposes from just mm -hmm. a JSON file. So we can actually then test our development or production by right. just loading a file. So we can see that these endpoints are all loaded in and these are stored inside of the app's um, setting, so it's retained through everything else. So if we need to change something, we could push some configuration that, file to that it. That kind of winds up being the next, the next iteration of this whole um, idea of obfuscating, mm -hmm. right? Like if you were used to for calling um, an app, an Azure app service, you know, you've got the actual URL hard coded in your code, yeah. right? Yeah. Of course it works great, yeah. but if you think about it, that's the next thing that you want to start knowing how to oh, abstract no. that mm -hmm. because somebody might say, oh, that's really nice, but you're going to call this service yeah. and it lives over here and it's written this way. Here's your RESTful endpoint. Exactly. So yeah. that's a, a good example of, of that because that booking endpoint could be sitting in Azure. It could be sitting somewhere, somewhere else. else. Yeah, totally. That way you're not no, just you're restricting right. it. So you don't have to do a whole app update just to update yes. that. So what's cool here though is I really like this architecture. So let's say I want to get my latest bookings. Notice I have this request service, so it's really mm -hmm. service-based, and we have this just really generic thing called get async. And it's going to give me a bunch of booking summaries. So if I peek in here, this is like the hotel, when yep. it's from. So what's cool, and I really like to show, I start, start to architect all my applications this way. Uh, so if I go to definition, we have this idea of even obfuscating out are asynchronous calls to the server. Mm -hmm. Because what are you doing? You're making gets and posts and puts okay. um, back and forth. So what we do is we have ones that require tokens or don't require tokens. So these things have get and post and put. And we look at the implementation here, uh, we can see that I can just send it a T result. So I can send it anything. Give me my bookings. Send me this. Because it's just returning JSON. Right. And we use JSON.net to deserialize our object. So here we create an HTTP client with our token. We go and get that information. We handle the response, and that handling of the response needs to be done for every single call, which is seeing if it's successful, if it's forbidden, okay. and we can propagate up proper exceptions. And then we just deserialize that object back. Hmm. So that way we don't have to go write 8,000 different deserialization of JSON. We use the power right. of C Sharp and .NET, right, to actually use all this cool asynchronous stuff. We do stuff on the background so the UI is super responsive, like you saw. So for a developer, I could start adding new services easily and right. I say, hey, what does that data look like? Yep. And like pull it back in, which I absolutely love. And at the high level, I mean, that's what this series of services are. So as I go through, we can talk about authentication later, but we have booking, we have the hotel information, we have some mock ones, you see these fake ones mm -hmm. for development. So hey, I'm offline, I just want to do some development. Right. Uh, I have things uh, for that request service, for my suggestion service, so we have our real one, and they all use the same thing. So onboarding new services becomes just like a few minutes of yeah. development, which cool. is great. And of course, you know, we have our iOS, Android, and Windows 10 application, yep. just like you would expect. 
and user interface tests. So we ran a series of uh, UI tests up inside of uh, App Center every single a, time. Have you done a show on building UI tests? Because I hear it's not that easy. No, it's super easy. Is it's, it? It's super, okay. it's super easy. You can come in. We have pages and test pages, things like that. It's really simple. Okay. Uh, we have a few shows on the Xamarin show. Um, but I'm actually going to be having the App Center team on for a lot of um, a lot of that soon. So definitely okay. take a look there. Yeah, and I mean inside these projects aren't really that much. It's pretty minimal code. But this is a real app, right? So we have some custom renderers. So here I have some calendar and some custom map stuff that I have because I'm extending the controls. So you can take any Xamarin Forms control and extend Let's it. See one of those codes. Yeah. So if I look at like the cal this calendar button here. Um, I have some code that's essentially coming in. That's a custom element. So what is it doing actually? Yeah. So this one is essentially the calendar button that goes um, back and forth when I was going and booking the date. So if I want to go to the next or to the other side. Okay. So what this does is it measures out some specific um, properties and updates different colors on Android um, and, and actually draws a gradient over it. Okay. So that's something that you really can't do. So we leverage this custom render say, hey, in Android, I can draw a gradient. So I'm just going to go and do that with a few lines of code here. Mm -hmm. And then what's cool is that we can change the image or the background based on the different state that it may be on to, to kind of spice it up a little bit. And besides that, there's really not much else in here. We have like an NFC service because this is talking to the NFC controller. And one more question: Would you That's have to it. do a different renderer for each OS? Mm. Yeah, great question. So, um, how custom renderers work um, are a way of spicing up a control. So this control isn't doing exactly what I want it to do, or I want to replace it. I want every button to look like a flying bird for some okay. reason. I don't know. And it flutters whenever you tap on it. That's pretty custom, right? Yeah. So you would implement that. If, it, if you can't do it cross-platform, you implement it on each platform. So when you go into the iOS application here, a um, bunch of nougats, but we'll also see renderers and a calendar button renderer. Okay. There we go. But a lot of these, we didn't have to do too many because a lot of them were done for us with plugins automatically. So a lot of those mm -hmm. cross-platform ones were already done. And in fact, if I was a developer of this app or apps for my company, I would probably have an entire suite of just my own UI toolkit. That way, I once I do it once, I can then right. you know share it through apps. Yeah, and that's it. That's essentially the structure of the application, mm -hmm. which again is going to look very familiar to what we've showed before. Yeah. The biggest difference here, since it's all Xamarin Forms, is all of the user interface is inside of that .NET standard project. Yep. Um, anything that's shared cross-platform. So basically everything but those renderers mm -hmm. or accessing that platform-specific code like NFC. And then yeah. you have different views for UWP because the idea is that although you could run it on a Windows mobile phone, in all likelihood mm -hmm. you're running it on a Surface or a laptop or something and therefore you're going to do a different UI to take advantage of that. Exactly. Okay. That, that's a great observation there. I do this um, quite often. Uh, inside of my applications, sometimes on iOS, I want it, I want like the entire navigation to be tab based, for instance. Mm -hmm. But on Windows and on Android, I want the fly out navigation, just because okay. that's what my designer told me to do. Right. So I would have a iOS navigation, basically wrapper, and then mm -hmm. on the other platforms, I would use the same. Now the key here is that this suggestion view, if I go into it here, isn't very much code because it's going to be using some reusable controls okay. um, and, and it's going to use the same view model. So you can see it's actually using this suggestion item template, but it's just using it a yep. little bit different. So if I came into um, the suggestions here uh, on Android, let me go ahead and tap on it. should be able to go into it. Let's see if it's going to load. I forget where exactly I have to tap on this thing. Should go into oh there we go, so in here we have a little bit different of a view mm -hmm. because this makes sense on mobile right. where I'm coming in and I'm actually swiping left and right for instance yep. here compared to on UWP I have it this way okay and I can do some customization around how I want it to right. act you could display yeah. more information here take advantage of the of the bigger screen, screen. Real estate. yeah and the other thing too is that the UWP application is like really responsive too sure. So we, they actually have some code in here. So if you are on a, a smaller device, mm -hmm. it'll automatically, a smaller tablet or your landscape or portrait, for instance, it'll automatically um, um, do that for you, yep. which is really cool. And you can see it go back and forth yep. and 
um, um, display different information. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and and all the XAML um, is going to be very familiar as well. So what's nice here is that if you look at that um, our login view, for instance, we have. We have a bunch of stuff in here, <laughs> um, things like styles. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of setters. So we want this logo of this image to have aspect, this height. We can apply styles to controls, for instance. Um, uh, when I come into this page, these are going to look very familiar. We have things like a grid. So this is going to have two rows, one that's 60%, one that's 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, we're using another plugin um, that's called FF Image Loading. So while Xamarin.Forms has an image control, this is a really cool open source library that optimizes downloading and caching images, okay. which is really nifty. If you if your designer gives you like a five meg file, you shouldn't try to download into your app. But if you do, right. this library will automatically resize it for you. So that's pretty cool. And then we have a sign-in form, right? So inside mm -hmm. of here, uh, we have um, this, there's some images in here. We have a label that um, is bound to a, a translation of username. Um, inside of here, we have an entry field, which is the username uh, area here. We have this really cool um, specification in the XAML called on idiom. So this is saying on desktop, make this control center. But on uh, phone, fill and expand it. Okay. You can do that for iOS, Android, Windows 10. Um, as well. So that's a really cool way of specifying right in the XAML. And you can do that do. in code if you wanted to. Absolutely. Right? Everything that you can do in XAML, right. you can do in C Sharp yep. uh, code. So again, we have another one that's called password, um, an extended control, and then we have a lot of grids, <laughs> all about those grids. And then we have like a sign up button, things like that, mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. So it's just XAML, you're using your styles, you're using yep. background colors, you're using static resources that are going to be described. So if I go into my app XAML, I have all my colors. So I don't have to hard code these values everywhere, right? right? I'm just reusing the accent color, the background color. I have converters, so I, I value converters that are being used um, those in are the all, application. Those are all in the source code, right? Yeah, so if I come over right. here, I could definitely look at this check-in time converter that's going to take a date time, parse it, and return uh, something back specific mm -hmm. for a string cool. to display in the user interface. And these are just I value converters. Yep. So see how everything kind of feels pretty yeah. familiar? Some of the names look different, but you know, uh, yeah, overall. It doesn't take very long to yeah. deal with the fact that there's no stack panel anymore. Oh, yeah. There's the same thing. What's it called? Exactly, right. yeah. So the XAML looks very, very uh, familiar there. Mm -hmm. And I would say, even if you're like, oh, James, how did you do that? You know. Um, how do you do this crazy charts and graphs and things like that, right? If I actually look at the home view over here, we're actually using that chart to do this temperature. So this line of code here maps to this chart for the temperature. And we have mm -hmm. another one for the ambient light and this. It's all that cross-platform micro chart drawing. So I just give it a series of entries and the type of chart I want, and boom, it displays everything for mm. me automatically. Cool. So that's why Xamarin Forms is really powerful, not only does Xamarin, because you get access to all the, the native APIs, all the native UI, but you have access to that cross-platform too via these libraries, yep. what's in the box, or extensibility. So there's a lot that you can do with it. This is the cool thing about this code being available in the, the GitHub repo. I've already gone in and leveraged <laughs> some of the code for, yeah. for things I'm building myself is there's there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. You can just go in and grab that code yeah. and use it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, when they're looking to say, oh, how do I architect an app, or what's the best, where should I put what where, right? right? When does it make sense to use this? Or how do I get that really cool chart? Or how do I get that map thing? Like how do I do that? Menu. That's, yeah, that grab it, right? I, I, yeah, just grab it, right? Yeah, just grab it. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. even this, like a common thing that we see time and time again is, Authentication, right? We talked mm -hmm. about how I authenticate when I do NFC, when I log in yep. um, into the application, and that's all done with Azure um, B2C. So this is like the login page here, and I can log in with a username or I can log in with my actual Microsoft account right here. Yep. So this is using Active Directory B2C, mm -hmm. and I've, I've done it so I have the username password or this login page. And it's actually super simple to do. It's a cross-platform library. I simply say acquire token async. 
Yeah. I call this method, login with Microsoft, when I click that button, and it goes and it grabs everything for me automatically. And in fact, on top of that, it will get the attributes for that user. So it'll give me the email, the given name, and the family. That's how you saw mm. my, my information there. Yep. Yeah, which is super cool. So just by doing that, there's even code in there that. to get your avatar. Yeah, which is crazy, right? So a lot of these common things. So here's this gravatar. Yeah. So here, this is going to be um, where's our gravatar um, implementation? Again, everything's um, interface first. So here, we're using gravatar um, to create some MD5 hash. Uh -huh. Take that email address, go to gravatar, pull it down, and you see that's how you see that nice banner and on the actual right. door, which yep. is cool too. And we're re reusing code too. That's the cool part of this kind of suite of products is that we're sharing code between our authentication here, inside of our maintenance application, inside of our smart door, mm -hmm. and we can share user interface between all of our applications, styles, um, and reuse all those great libraries that are out there. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. There's a lot of code in here. Yeah, it's so good. I mean, and, th and I think that's what's really cool about it is that you can see how we did it, right? Yep. If you're like, oh, James, I, s I understand that NFC is only on a few devices. Maybe there's not a plugin for it or what is a plugin. I got that code. If you're like, oh, I'm really interested to know how did they do location. So if I go into my location service here in mm -hmm. code, this is in cross-platform code. Uh, and you would think, well, you know, NFC, I, you just showed me that code, James, right, to go yep. access the NFC stuff. Well, that's because there wasn't a plugin for it, but the APIs are available. But for getting geolocation or settings or media or some of these UI controls, we have plugins for Xamarin. So what this does is it goes and uses our geolocator plugin, uh, which I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and this goes and with a single line of code, gets our position asynchronously Cool. on iOS, Android, or Windows. Handles permissions for you, does everything, and it gives you back uh, latitude and longitude. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, one line of code, like, so for me getting started, yeah. it's cool to see all of this, but I just want to get the location. How did they right. do that? Yeah. You can grab it right here. Yeah. Which is super simple. You can see how we handle um, all of our exceptions, how we can do everything right inside the code. They're really simple. I mean, get geolocation, handle exceptions, nothing. Mm -hmm. Super simple. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. No, no, no. That's like, there's so, I mean, I think like you can just literally dive through yep. so much of the app uh, in general inside of here. I absolutely love it. I mean, I, I highly yeah. recommend that, that people do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can, of course, we'll add the links to, uh, in the show yep. notes below, right? Yep. Get yeah. Code, see how it works, and, yeah. and reuse as much as, as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Build better apps. Yeah. Any other questions that you have for me on no. this thing? <laughs> no, it's so cool. good. All right, let me show you one more thing. All right. So, um, I was showing in the XAML, right, on that login page. I get this question all the time, and I wanted to make sure that I covered it since I had this opportunity, is translations, right? Okay. How, right now, we translated this just for English, but notice when I have sign up here, that's not hard coded. I'm using this translate extension, okay? And I'm using ResX files, just like I always have, to actually do the translations. So, this translate extension extends that um, binding, hmm. and what it's doing is it's saying inside of this assembly is something called resources okay. in a ResX file. And down here, sure enough, we have all of our ResX here, um, which actually pulls and it gets everything for you. Okay. Now, what's really nice is that you can combine this with something like our multilingual app toolkit, uh, which where we have some Xamarin shows on and great documentation which is a service that we provide here at Microsoft to take any of your ResX files and translate them into anything that Bing can translate oh. automatically. Wow. I did this for the first time a few months ago and it blew my mind. I right clicked on the file and I had 20 different languages translated all automatically. Nice. So this is cool because now if you're familiar with ResX, you have, we have these markup extensions which says, mm -hmm. hey, translate it, translate sign up, which is okay. in the ResX file, put it in there. Oh, cool. Super awesome. And if you start that from the beginning, because you know you're, you might want to add Spanish mm -hmm. or some other language later on, because um, the app stores provide all of them, right? And then you can just change oh, right. the language on the operating system to test it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, you can set the current culture, right? Remember, yeah. we have current culture yeah. of whatever the threat yeah. is, and boom, you can see the entire app and different things. Cool. Yeah. Show me the, the UI tests a little bit. Yeah, sure. And are these the same tests that you could send up to Test Cloud? Yeah. 
So App Center <laughs> Test now is now the evolution of Test Cloud. Okay, right. So all the great functionality that you had inside uh, of it is over there. Okay. So this is super simple. We do this thing called page-based testing. Mm -hmm. So if you think of an application, it's almost like a website. I'm testing this single page. Mm -hmm. And often I need to get from page one to page five. So instead of writing the same functionality over and over again, we put them in these things called pages. Mm -hmm. So I'll zoom in over here. And we can see the pages that we have. We have a home page, a login page, a book page, a hotel page, things that we literally just tap through. So if I look at that um, login page, the idea here is that at any point I can come in and uh, I can then grab um, any of the fields. So here I'm saying on Android, um, these are some different uh, attributes that you may look for. So there's an email field, there's a password field, and these are unique identifiers. Mm -hmm. So let me show you what this maps to. So if I go into the login view up here, and I look at that uh, entry field, let me go and find it here, automation ID. So we've uh, optimized okay. Xamarin Forms, so you say automation ID. So that password. answers my next question mm -hmm. was, what happens if it's not displaying as password? So you're exactly. using the automation ID. You don't have to use a string, yeah. use the yep. automation okay. thing. And then all we do here is we say, wait for the, e mm. so enter credentials, wait for the, uh, wait for the email field to be there, mm -hmm. tap the email field, enter the username that I passed in, dismiss the keyboard, do it for password, mm -hmm. and then make sure that the, the, the credentials were entered. And then we can go on from there. And then sign in, I tap sign in. So when I come over into my tasks, and I look at this here, we can see my single task is now just a few lines of code. To log in, I mm -hmm. give it some username password, hit sign in, and then I create a new home page. And then make sure that when I create this home page, um, it's looking to make sure that the navigation is set up and everything is good to go. But from that point, I could open the navigation mm -hmm. drawer. I could do something a little bit different on iOS versus Android. And we can run all of those um, if you're still using Test Cloud or App Center Test. OK. Yeah. Cool. So it's really surprisingly um, easy to get up and running yeah. as long as you're following those kind of best practices, right. which guess what? This app does. <laughs> Of course. So, yeah, <laughs> which is really cool. Excellent. Because that didn't look too hard, right? This, this no, looks, that doesn't look hard. That doesn't okay, look hard. Cool. You can tap a button. D just whatever you're doing, in, right. right? In the app, you're like, oh, I'm going to tap this. I'm going to enter this. And they align really nice um, to what, what's happening right here in the UI. Are yeah. there uh, UI recorders that'll uh, build that script for you based on what you're doing literally on the device? Yeah, over on the Mac, we have one. Um, we have an extension that's in was in preview for uh, Visual Studio, but we actually have a REPL, which we really like. So when I hit debug um, on my test, mm -hmm. it'll pop up a little explorer. So okay. I can say, give me tree, and it'll output everything. And I can say app.tap and then copy that back in. Got it. Okay. We do have a test recorder over on uh, the Mac, though, for mm -hmm. iOS and Android. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I think that's all. I just want to make sure I hit those. But I'm yes, glad that you that the way you talk about UI tests. I don't get to talk about it too often, and, and this one is structured yeah. really lovely. All yeah. right. Very cool. cool. Yeah. All right. There you have Thanks it. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.